Well, hi there and welcome to our Bible study on the book of Acts. And we're on chapter 16, which is kind of an interesting chapter, because this is now where the gospel message is actually entering Rome. But before we begin, let's open with a word of prayer. Father God, we give you thanks and praise, glory and honor that across the miles we can gather together and learn your word and worship you. I pray, Father, for the Lighthouse Discord server. Jesus, you are the light of the world and God is the source of light. And this is a house for your people to hang. This is a place for your children to either come to know you and receive you as Lord and Savior or to draw closer to you or both. So God, I pray for every need represented on the server, those that are spoken, those that are unspoken, those that are written, those that are unwritten, and those that are sent in DM. You know, every person, you know what's on their heart, you know, the status of their condition with you. You know, whether they're legit or not. And you know, Lord, every need that we have, physical, spiritual, mental, emotional, you know it all. So God, I pray today that you would open our hearts and minds to receive what you would have for us. And I pray that you would use your servant, Lord, to speak your word of truth. We give you all the praise and glory. In the holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So today we're reading from Acts chapter 16, and it starts with the Macedonian vision. <coughs> Excuse me. Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra. And a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was Greek. And he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted this man to go with him. And he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now, while they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the decrees which had been decided upon by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem for them to observe. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. They passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Mysia, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. And passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So putting out to sea from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace and on the day following to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony. And we were staying in this city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. The first convert in Europe, a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things Paul spoke, sorry, to the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. It happened that as we were going to the place of prayer, a slave girl having a spirit of divination met us 
who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune telling. Following after Paula, now she kept crying out, saying, These men are bond servants of the Most High God, who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. She continued doing this for many days, but Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out at that very moment. But when her masters saw their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. And when they had brought them to the chief magistrates, they said, these men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews, and are proclaiming customs, which it is not lawful for us to accept or to observe, being Romans. Paul and Silas imprisoned. The crowd rose up together against them. And the chief magistrates tore their robes off them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. When they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns, a praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison house were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do not Harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? The jailer converted. They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you, or Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. Now when the day came, the chief magistrate sent their policemen saying, release those men. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The chief magistrates have sent to release you. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us in public without trial, men who were Romans and have thrown us into prison, and now they are sending us away secretly? No, indeed. But let them come themselves and bring us out. The policemen reported these words to the chief magistrates. They were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. And they came and appealed to them. And when they had brought them out, they kept begging them to leave the city. They went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they saw the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. That's really quite the story. So the decision by the Jerusalem Council, which we learned about last time we met, to release Gentiles from the law of Moses kicked into motion a time of transition for the young church. Christians, you see, were no longer merely another Jewish sect, which is by the way, the whole thing about circumcision, if our commentary doesn't talk about it, I'm going to be bringing that up. I want to explain it. But the Jewish movement was rapidly becoming a predominantly Gentile movement. And the story as told in that shifts attention to the gospel's penetration deep into the Roman world. Because it required not just 
kind of gently walking in, but deep, deep roots. You know, when you think of a tree, right, how it penetrates the soil and it grows down. Now, there's some trees that where their roots sort of go along the top of the, um, like just barely under the dirt or soil or grass. But there's others that go very, very, very deep down in the soil, like many feet down and grab a hold of it. And that's how they stand. So this is the gospel being penetrated into the Roman world and also this book or this particular chapter talks about the widening ministry of Paul. So I read from the New American Standard or NASB. <clears throat> the book uses New King James. So we talk first about verse one. Then he, Paul, came to Derby and Lystra and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. So you see, Paul had regrouped with Silas, his new partner, and then he left on another missionary journey. Well, when Paul and Barnabas visited Lystra five years earlier, Paul was nearly killed by a crowd of adoring fans who suddenly turned violent and stoned him. This happened, by the way, <coughs> excuse me, in Acts chapter 14, verses 8 to 21. And he was left for dead beside the city. Out of that pile of bloody stones rose not only a battered but unbowed Paul, but also a Christian. So as I said in Acts chapter 14, verses 8 to 21, Paul was left for dead outside the city in Lystra. And out of that pile of bloody stones rose not only a battered, but on Bode Paul, but also a Christian church. And out of that church emerged a gifted young man named Timothy, who was to become one of Paul's most trusted co-workers and dearest friends. You see, Timothy was the son of a Jewish Christian mother and a Greek father. And his name actually means God honoring. And he was a lifelong student of the Bible. And we could look at 2 Timothy 3, verses 14 to 15 for that, but was not raised a strict Jew. His mother, Eunice, and his grandmother, Lois, were excellent spiritual models. And we could have a look at 2 Timothy 1, 5 for that. And Tim possessed spiritually valuable abilities, that is, gifts of the Holy Spirit, but he needed encouragement to use them. So we could look at 1 Timothy 4, 14, and 2 Timothy 1, 6. But even so, he was respected by fellow Christians who commissioned him for Christian ministry. And again, we could look at Acts 16, 2 and 2 Timothy 4, 14. So it's interesting that he was commissioned. I know some people who have been asked to go and speak or lead in various places. And it's truly a God-given honor to be asked to do those things. Then we have verses two and three. So he, Timothy, was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go on with him. And he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. So what is this? Because Paul is the champion of spiritual freedom who argued successfully for liberation of Gentiles from the necessity of circumcision, who was in Lystra to pass that good news to the church there. And now he does a 180 by circumcising Timothy. So what's wrong with this picture? What was Paul doing? Well, let me first explain. You see, in the Jewish faith, circumcision was a sign that you were set apart for God. So 
in the early church, the majority of Christians at the beginning were Jewish. They were the believers. And over time, Gentiles, that is non-Jewish people, received Christ. And, and what happened when they believed is that there was what's called a circumcision of the heart or a change of heart. So the physical act of circumcision was no longer required because Jesus had died on the cross. He bore the sins. It's that change of heart, that change of person that made the difference. So it's very, very different from before Jesus' death and resurrection. And it's interesting because our commentator says some people accuse Paul of inconsistency. Perhaps. But foolish consistency, wrote R.W. Emerson, as the hobgoblin of little minds. And Paul's was no little mind. He was never as committed to the wisdom of the Jerusalem council as to the mind of Christ. Have a look at 1 Corinthians 2, 9 to 16, or 2 Corinthians 10, 5. You see, he was more concerned with the day-to-day -day leadership of the Holy Spirit. And no set of rules can cover all the surprises and serendipities involved with the Holy Spirit's personal leading. Serendipities is unexpected, delightful discoveries and experiences. And in circumcising Timothy, Paul acted according to higher principles than the principles of freedom, personal preference, or doing the least the church demands. Far more important to him were the following things. The first is the principle of personal obedience to Christ. See 2 Corinthians 10.5. The second is the principle of living by the Spirit, not the letter of the law. Look at 2 Corinthians 3.6. The third is the principle of accommodation on non-essentials in order to communicate the gospel to diverse people. See 1 Corinthians 9. 19 to 23. And thirdly, the principle of love. Have a look at 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 8. Now, <laughs> there was two main reasons why Timothy chose this elective surgery. Both are because of the Jews. Acts 16, 3, and both have to do with the team's priority of taking the gospel to the Jews in every city. First, that is. Acts 13, 5 and 14, Acts 14, 1, Acts 16, 13, Acts 17, 2, 10, and 17, and Acts 18, 4, and Romans 1, 16. First, you see, Timothy wanted to assure Jews that following Christ did not mean they had to stop being Jewish. And that's something that's critical. And second, he wanted all the credibility he could get with the Jews that they would be trying to reach. You see, he didn't have to submit to circumcision to be accepted by God or by the church, but because he loved the Jewish people, he surrendered his rights in order to serve them. Have a look at Matthew 20, verses 27 to 28. Now, I'm not going to get into it all because I don't think it's necessarily appropriate, but I have a Jewish friend online, and typically a baby is circumcised at age eight days, and I can't imagine how painful that would be for that little one, but he said that very often they give them just a bit of Tylenol. I can't even imagine how painful that is. But Jews today even still do circumcision. Now, Acts 16, 4 to 10, the big picture here is that Paul and his friends delivered the Jerusalem apostles' decision and the church's group. The Holy Spirit kept Paul from preaching in Asia and from entering Bithynia. 
Paul had a vision of a man asking him to come to Macedonia. So they went. You see, Christian workers' movements are a blend of strategic planning and sensitivity to the spirit. And Acts 16, verses 6 to 10, describes four ways that the team experienced the Lord's step-by-step -step leadership. The first was spiritual roadblocks. They were forbidden by the Holy Spirit from preaching in Asia province. Talks about that in Acts 16, verse 6. So how the Spirit did this, we're not told. Was it prophecy? Like 1 Timothy 4.14? 4, or uneasiness? Like Colossians 3.15 about a planned action? We don't know. Then we've got adverse conditions and physical limitations. The Spirit of Jesus did not permit them to go north towards Bithynia. Acts 16, 7. And perhaps Paul became sick and he needed a doctor. Well, again, we don't know, but they went to Troas where their friend Luke was, and Luke was a doctor. Paul's sickness was the Lord's way of denying permission to visit a place not on the divine itinerary. Then we have verse, or sorry, then we have number three, which is vision. Acts 16, verse 9. A vision in the night is the literal translation. And the same mental picture came to Paul repeatedly that night. A Macedonian stood pleading for Paul and the team to cross the Aegean Sea to Europe and help us. And then number four was team agreement. When Paul shared his vision, the team, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke, started packing. Concluding the vision was a call from God. We hear about that in Acts 16.10. And the whole team agreed the vision was God communicating his will. So closed doors, which are circumstances making a course of action impossible or impractical, and circumstances that kept them moving westward to Troas, or west, northwest to Troas. And there with their toes in the Aegean, the orders they'd been listening for came in an all-night vision and team consensus. And at Troas, so quietly, the average reader may miss it, another member joined the team aboard the ship for Macedonia and actually stuck with Paul like flypaper until the last chapter of Acts. He doesn't wear a name tag. The subtle insertion of the little two-letter first-person plural pronouns we and us in Acts 16.10 and 96 other verses in Acts, reveals that the author of Acts had signed on. Most of what he writes from this point on is an eyewitness recall. Luke was a Greek. Now understand that Luke wrote the book of Luke, and then he wrote the book of Acts. And this is like the sequel or book two. And Paul calls him Luke, the beloved physician in Colossians 4.14. Unconfirmed early church stories about Luke suggest these intriguing possibilities. <clears throat> the one is that he was Theophilus' slave. Talk, look at Acts 1.1. 1, 1. And he may have been freed after he restored his master's health. Two, that he was a charter member of the Antioch church. Three, that he was in Troas waiting to sign on as a ship's doctor. And four, he joined the team as personal physician to the frequently ailing Paul. So it's really interesting to read some of this information from a commentary because of the fact that these are things that, you know, per, the average person may not necessarily pick up. And then verse 11, therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis. So at last, the spirit says, go. So the team headed for the dock with Europe or bus stickers on their luggage, basically. I mean, not really, but it's, it's a fun thought. But their first port of call on the way to Macedonia was Samothrace, which was a mountain island rising 5,000 feet above the sea. 
And the next day, passengers and cargo were unloaded at Neapolis, which is actually now modern Kavala, Greece, which is a seaport for Philippi. John Pollock wrote this. They did not think of themselves as passing from the continent of Asia to Europe. These terms were in use, but the Aegean was Greek on either side. They had instead the excitement of approaching a new province, bringing them nearer Rome. They knew that beyond Macedonia, they could reach Achaia and Italy and the vast lands of Gaul, Spain, Germania, and even the misbound island of Britain lately added to the empire all save Rome, untouched by the good news. They were not bringing for a force of arms or a political program, just four men and another invisible. Of course, Jesus. Verses 12 to 13. And from there to Philippi, which is the formal city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now, Philippi was a Roman colony where citizens dressed Roman, spoke Latin, and lived by Roman law. And it was a commercial center on the Via Ignatia, the main overland route between the Aegean and Adriatic seas. And it was named for Philip of Macedon, father of Alexander the Great. And much of the population, interestingly, was retired military personnel. And the Jewish population of Philippi was too small for a synagogue, which required a minimum of 10 men. Jews gathered at the riverside for Sabbath prayers and at the river Gan Gangites, the apostles found a group of Jewish and God-fearing Gentile women and told them about Jesus. Note this, the Philippian church began with a group of praying women. As Christianity spread in the Roman Empire, women greatly outnumbered men among early converts. Acts 16 verses 14 to 15. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira, who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. You see, Macedonian women were noted for their independence. Under Roman law, a freeborn woman with three children or a free freed woman with four children had the right to own property and enter into legal transactions without the consent of a husband or father. A freed woman, by the way, was a liberated female slave. So many Macedonian women became highly influential, and one such woman was Lydia, a God-fearing Gentile who heard Paul preach at the Riverside prayer meeting. She conducted a successful business in purple cloth dyed with the secretions of a rare Mediterranean shellfish. So rare and costly was this dye, only the wealthy could afford the cloth. And for those on the server who are listening in, if you've ever played Minecraft, this is what it reminds me of is when because I can't stand those squid things that I find in the water. And when you kill them, you get black dye. And they're not, you know, something that's always out there, but I just find that interesting. So here is Mediterranean shellfish. And trading in this exquisite fabric had made Lydia wealthy. And she was ahead of her own household. So the Lord opened Lydia's heart. Look at John 6, 44. And she believed in Jesus becoming the first person on the European continent to turn to Christ. And after she and her entire household, household meaning family, servants, slaves, and any other dependents, after they were baptized, she persuaded the team to stay at her home. 
Now, women were attracted to early Christianity because within the Christian community, women enjoyed higher status and security than among their pagan neighbors. By contrast to pagan women who are married very young, often before puberty, Christian women had more freedom to decide if and when they would marry. Christian husbands could not easily divorce their wives. Marital faithfulness was expected of both Christian husbands and wives. Very interesting, I think. So then we get into verse 16. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. So the second European impacted by the good news came from the opposite end of the social spectrum from Lydia. She was a slave physically and spiritually. She was mentally ill. She was tormented by an evil spirit that Luke describes as Numa Pythona, the spirit of Python, which controlled her speech. And I have a hard time with this for anyone who doesn't realize that I have a severe phobia, but I will try. A python was a mystical snake guarding ecstatic speeches of the god Apollo. And the ancient world had a strange respect for mad people because they said the gods had taken away their wits in order to put the minds of the girls into them. And the Philippians believed this girl was clairvoyant, that she could tell the future. Her owners charged high fees for her services as a fortune teller. And just so you know, we talked about this last night for anyone who was part of our Thursday study. It this falls under the auspices of black magic. And it's absolutely 100% against the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's bad, very bad. Acts 16, 17 to 18. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. So when this tormented girl followed Paul and the others around, announcing that they were God's servants, telling the way of salvation, Paul didn't take it as a compliment. You see, it continued several days and Paul became annoyed. And that's quite honestly putting it mildly. The Greek word means strongly irked, provoked, and worked up with anger or grief. The tortured girl told the truth. But when the devil tells the truth, the effect is always confusion. Have a look at Mark 1, 23 to 26. Finally, Paul whirled around and in Jesus' name commanded the evil spirit to come out of her. And instantly, the mental anguish ended and the slave girl was free from her spiritual bondage. Luke doesn't say that she became a Christian, but likely she did. And we have verses 19 to 24. Just give me one moment, please. But when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city and they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. And having received such a charge, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. You see, when they realized their prophets had flown the coop along with the evil spirit, the girl's owners hit the ceiling. And Luke uses the same Greek word in verse 18 for departure of the evil spirit as he does in verse 19 for departure of the owner's profits. Their ill-gotten gain was literally exercised or expelled 
gotten rid of, along with the tormenting spirit. Typical of people whose bottom line is money, they had no concern for the girl's welfare and no gratitude for her healing. She was, after all, property. See, here's the thing. Romans referred to slaves as living tools. And by healing her, Paul had violated their property rights. And the owners played on the crowd's anti-Semitic sentiments. Their charges never mentioned the real reason for their ire, which was their loss of revenue. They accused Paul and Silas of being anti-Roman. So if the truth doesn't sell, try lies. So without investigating the charges, the magistrates ordered Paul and Silas beaten and jailed. And you could look at 2 Corinthians 11.25 for the part about being beaten. And the jailer was ordered to guard them carefully. So he locked them in the jail's maximum security cell and he clamped their feet in stocks. You see, the economic effects of Christians' commitment to help people can trigger animosity. And during AD 257 and 258 in Rome, Lawrence, a deacon of the church at Rome, was ordered to hand over the treasures of the church to the head of the empire's pagan religion. Lawrence promised to comply. And next day, he gave all the money to the city's poor. And the church cared for about 1,500 Roman widows and orphans at the time. So when officials asked where the treasures were, Lawrence pointed to the poor. These are the treasures of the church, he said. And you know what happened to him? He was beheaded for his disobedience. In, 19, in the 1990s, in suburban Phoenix, Arizona, a church ministering to the homeless came under attack by neighbors who claimed the presence of the homeless people was causing their property values to drop. So city government intervened and ordered the church to stop its outreach to the homeless. Now, I'm Canadian, and there's a city an hour south of us. And the mayor of that city, and, and I'm so disturbed by this, but the mayor of that city wanted a homeless shelter to be closed. Since we're in spring now, it wasn't needed anymore. But where were these people to go? The streets? You see, he claims, and I don't mean to get political, but he claims that they're a danger to the seniors who live in the area. He claims that they're a danger to society. Well, let me ask you a question. If you have a place to lie your head at night and you have food to eat each day, are you not going to be less likely to be troublesome than if you don't have any of those things and you're living in a sleeping bag or blankets under a bush or at the back of something uh, in the park? I'm just throwing that out there. Verses 25 and 26. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and they sang hymns to God, right? And then the prisoners are listening. And suddenly there's this earthquake. The foundations of the prison were shaken and all the doors open and everyone's chains are loosened. Now, this was not exactly a nice setting. It was colder than a witch's elbow and blacker than the ace of spades. And it would have smelled horrendous. And the stocks were ingeniously designed to immobilize the feet and legs for maximum discomfort. And I'm showing a picture. And if you can imagine two logs four foot long with a little bit of a cutout to fit around your ankles and then wrapped with some kind of rope. And you're sitting in whatever filth is there with chains attached to the wall 
and a large metal cuff around each wrist and the chain tied together at the wrist so that you have very little movement in your arms. That's what these men were in. And <laughs> their backs were bruised, they were torn, and they were punished illegally for an act of mercy. <sighs> but you see, they had no time for self-pity. And they decided to rejoice and sing hymns. And the beautiful thing is <laughs> that the chains were broken. And they could have escaped, but they didn't. And in fact, the jailer found Jesus. And the other prisoners got a taste of the gospel too. So then in verses 27 and 28, the keeper of the prison awakens, sees the doors open. And quite honestly, he was going to take his life. And the reason for that is that would have been his payment. If they had escaped, the jailer would have been murdered. That's how they dealt with him. He would be given the punishment that the fugitives would have received. So an executed criminal's property would be confiscated. To protect his family from the loss of their property, he grabbed his sword to take his own life. But Paul shouted, don't do it, we're all here. So then in verses 29 and 30, then he calls for a light ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You see, as a Roman and a pagan, did the jailer actually understand what he was asking? Now, he may have heard the fortune teller say that these men came to tell people how to be saved. He may have felt supernatural power in the earthquake. Well, he probably would have. And believed Paul and Silas were connected with it. He'd been on the brink of suicide, perhaps by asking how he could escape his superior's punishment. And his response to the answer shows that he understood his need for spiritual restoration. And he sincerely wanted to know how to get it. You see, that's something that we all need to understand. It's all well and good to call ourselves Christians. It's all well and good to go to church. But at the end of the day, do we really know how to be spiritually restored? Do we really know how to be saved? So they said in verses 31 to 32, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. You see, the answer was really that there was nothing the jailer needed to do. Everything necessary for his salvation had been done for him by Christ. All that was required was to believe in Jesus. And furthermore, the same offer was extended to everyone in his house. And it's really a familiar pattern in the book of Acts. The head of the house trusts Jesus. The rest of the family follows believing and being baptized. For that, you could look at Acts 10 2, Acts 16, 14 to 15, and Acts 16, 33 to 34. You see, all are included in God's promise of salvation. Each must simply make his or her personal decision to believe. And I'm going to tell you something, friends. That applies today, too. It's all it takes. Not rocket science. Sometimes we make it so complicated. Ah, oh, we don't want to give up sin. We don't want to give up those things in our life that we enjoy. Oh, no, 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 no. That would be too dreadful. But you know what? Being that I'm over my middle age now, I'm pretty sure. I can tell you truthfully that this period of time on this earth is a drop in the bucket to eternity. So if you want to compare what it's like to spend eternity in hell and damnation and fire and torment, have at her. 
personally, I don't want to go there. Oh, I've done my share of sin like everybody else. But when we genuinely repent and turn from that sin, God honors us and he forgives us. And that's been done by the blood of Christ. So then we read in verses 33 to 34, the jailer basically took them at the same hour, he washes them. And then he and his family were baptized and he brought them into his house and he set food before them and he rejoiced because he believed in God with all his household. So see, there's four evidences of the authenticity of the jailer's conversion. The first is that he made amends. He nursed Paul and Silas's wounds. Second, he was baptized. He and his family confessed their faith and were baptized. Now, this is something a lot of people believe that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. I say you don't have to be. Like, it's not critical, but it's very, very important. My mother, for example, would have been baptized as a baby if she would have been literally baptized in water, she would have drowned. Or someone with seizures would have drowned if you immerse them in water. So there are certain circumstances when there's other forms of baptism, like sprinkling a bit of water or sometimes pouring a little bit. A lot of churches would say that's not acceptable. But sometimes for a person's health, you don't have a choice. But also there was table fellowship because he shared a meal then with Paul and Silas in his home. And then lastly, there's joy. The jailer and his family rejoiced over their new faith in God. William Barclay wrote, unless a man's Christianity makes him kind, it is not real. Unless a man's professed change of heart is guaranteed by his change of deeds, it is a spurious thing. Spurious. S-P-U-R-I-O-U-S means illegitimate or falsified origin. Then we read in verses 35 to 39. And when it's day, the magistrate sent the officer saying, let those men go. So the keeper of the prison reports these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now, therefore, depart and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they've beaten us openly uncondemned. Romans and have thrown us into prison. And now do they put us out secretly? No, indeed. Let them come themselves and get us out. And the officers told these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. Then they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from the city. <clears throat> you see, at daybreak, officers came with the orders to release the prisoners. But to their chagrin, the prisoners refused to leave. Paul and Silas demanded the magistrates who had plunked them in the pokey illegally and unjustly come, apologize for their gross negligence, and personally escort them out. <laughs> Paul says they've beaten us openly uncondemned Romans. Ooh. A shiver of alarm ran up and down the magistrate's collective spines. You see, by law, Roman citizens could not be executed, beaten, tortured, or placed in stocks without a public hearing. But that's exactly what happened. Remind you of anybody? Well, let me tell you that Jesus... When he was put before trial, all of those meetings that he was forced to be in, they were mock trials. Not one of them prior to his crucifixion were legitimate. Not one of them were done according to proper law at the time. So when the judges show up to escort the apostles to freedom, it was with a markedly more conciliatory tone than when they ordered their incarceration. 
and they basically politely suggested that the apostles leave town. But Paul and Silas did not hesitate to use their rights as Roman citizens to protect themselves and others from unjust and arbitrary treatment because Philippian Christians would soon face persecution. I love the book of Philippians. It's my favorite book of the Bible. You can have a look at Philippians 1, 27 to 30. And so the apostles' protest may have actually helped protect some. Now, Lawrence O. Richards, who is the editor of this book, or uh, the series of books that we look at, wrote Christians do have a dual citizenship. Do you understand that, friends? We have a dual citizenship. We owe total allegiance to heaven. Yet even as we live by the laws of our earthly nation, so we can claim all the rights granted us here as well. Last verse, 40. So they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. So a small cadre of Christian believers gathered at Lydia's villa for final exhortations, encouragement. A baby church was beginning. Its membership spanned the social spectrum from an upper-class seller of expensive fabric, who's Lydia, a slave girl, a middle-class jailer and others that you can read about in Paul's letter to the Philippians. And at this point, Luke, the author, switches to third-person pronouns like they and them. You see, the good doctor stays behind to help deliver the baby church. Good choice, because Philippi was a medical center. Let's pray. Father, it's absolutely amazing to think what you did to Paul or for Paul and Silas. You made the way for all of us to receive you as Lord and Savior through what Jesus did on the cross. And so God, as we pray this prayer, as I pray it slowly now, if anyone chooses to say it aloud or under their breath or even silently, Lord, I pray, God, that they will be saved as well. Lord Jesus, I ask that you would forgive me for my sin. I ask, Lord, that you and your Holy Spirit would change my life. I repent from all my sins. I believe that you died on the cross, Jesus, and that you rose again three days later, ascended into heaven, and will one day come back for me. I believe and I trust you as my Lord and my Savior. Come into my life and change me. I thank you, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen.